are we becoming like Jesus? Just turn back to chapter 4, verse 1. Paul begins this section by telling the church that a sanctified walk or the way they live is God's will for them. And then he points out the primary things they need to pay attention to in order to live as sanctified people in a Roman society. You can see it there in verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, and that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. The old world sounds a lot like our world, doesn't it? The issue of sexual impurity, immorality, they were struggling with that in their world. We're struggling with that in our world today. So this is very timely for us, I think. Notice at the end, look at chapter 5, verse 23. A sanctified walk is only part of the picture of the sanctification that God desires in us. There's so much more God wants to sanctify. And Paul sums it up in the phrase, look at it, verse 23, your whole spirit and soul and body. Have you read, ever read Deuteronomy? Do you remember the Shema? That sounds a lot like it where Moses stands before the people and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul and with all your heart and with all your might. I know a Hebrew professor that says that probably should be translated all your stuff. (laughs) Everything that you have, everything that you are, with all that you are. That's what God wants to sanctify with us. I think it's similar here. All your your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body. So everything Paul says in 4, 1 through 5, 24, this whole last section of his letter connects to the idea of sanctification, being separate from the world, and distinct as the church, the body of Christ, reflecting the glory of Christ to the world around us. Now it's not as if Paul thinks they're completely lacking in sanctification. I wasn't here for your whole story, but this is one interesting part of the letter that I think connects again to sanctification. He opens the letter with an illustration of a a distinctive way they responded to the gospel, a distinctive way they spread the gospel to others. Do you remember that in chapter four or chapter one, verses four through ten? From the moment this church heard the gospel, they were changed, it says. They became different and distinct from society around them, and he uses the phrase turning away from their idols to serve the living God. And they did this in the face of growing animosity and persecution for them, even the threat of treason before the courts. But that's not all. The gospel that changed them then poured out through them, spreading to all of Macedonia, Acacia, and all the regions beyond. Wouldn't you love to see that happen here? that the gospel goes out from it. This is a story of amazing transformation, amazing evangelism, and I would also call it amazing sanctification. It's what made this church different, and people were talking about it, if you read that section. So this church already knows what sanctification looks like, It already knows what sanctification feels like. They've experienced it in their own lives. They've seen it in their gospel ministries. Still, Paul wants sanctification to grow and abound in every aspect of the church's life. In their loving, in their serving, in their helping, in their hope, in their teaching, in their correcting, in their listening, in their responding, 
in their praying, in their worship, in their walking in the world, in their distinction, even in their waiting for the Lord. He wants everything in this church to be different from the world and distinct for Jesus. Is that your desire? That every aspect of this church, every aspect of this life, every aspect in ministry that goes out would be uniquely labeled, I can see Jesus. I can see Jesus. I want you to notice something. It really plays into all these commands at the end. Paul's tone is not corrective, but rather encouraging, nurturing. It's even inspiring. Where he sees evidence of a healthy sanctification, as in their walk and their love for each other in verses uh, 1 through 12 of chapter 4, he urges them, abound still more, doesn't he? He sees it, he says, Keep doing that. Grow in that. Where he see, senses a weakness in their faith or understanding, he gently instructs them in a fatherly way. So he helps them onward towards a sanctified hope, towards a sanctified weight. Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't know about you, But Paul's tone, Paul's approach to sanctification makes you want to grow in sanctification. It makes you want to pursue sanctification as something you want to do, not something you have to do as a Christian. I don't know if that's how you've responded to this letter. That's the way I responded as I read through this church, this letter. It makes me want to keep becoming more and more like Jesus in every area of my life. And Paul agrees. Look at verse 11 of chapter 4. That's why he says, keep on encouraging one another. Keep on building one another up. That's really the, the tone of what he's saying there. Do you think your need for sanctification is limited to your walk, your love for each other, your hope, your waiting for the Lord? Oh no, there's, there's much more, there's much more. And so he wants to encourage them to live in a way that produces a growing Christ-likeness, an encouraging Christ-likeness in every aspect of their life and their ministry. He moves on with instructions then in this section on how this continual sanctification can become a way of life in the life of the church. Now the the verbs he uses, by the way, the instructions here are all in the plural. So don't read this as if Paul is talking to you individually about your life. This is all about how we can, as a church, grow in sanctification. And he gives it very simply, a word about your leaders, verses 12 and 13, a word about yourselves, verses 14 and 15, a word about your worship, verses 16 through 22, a word about your God, and then this curious farewell. I don't know if you've read the end, but it's interesting. We'll get there. If we want to see sanctification continue and grow, We need to listen to these words, what Paul has to tell us. So let's look at a word about the leaders. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in the Lord because of their work. Be be at peace among yourselves. A couple thoughts here. I want to just talk about the work that they do and then the response that they deserve. The work that they do is in three phrases that Paul uses to describe it. First, they labor among you. 
Now, when he says labor among you, he's not talking about collabor collaboration or teamwork. He's not talking about the fact that they often will roll up their sleeves and help the church get the job done. The idea here is of toil and sweat, striving and struggling and growing weary while doing the work of ministry. He uses the same words. Just turn back to 2 verse 9. He uses the same idea to describe his own ministry when he came to that church. He says, you remember, brothers, our labor and toil as we ministered among you. A lot of people think pastors work hard for an hour every Sunday, right? Yeah, they work hard one day a week. That's because they don't see all the mental and the emotional and the spiritual toll it takes to prepare a sermon or to tr counsel a troubled family or comfort a grieving widow or lead a grumbling church. Then there's the development of leaders, the training of teachers, the welcoming of newcomers, the baptizing of new believers, marrying and bearing. All of that before we come to the demands of their own family. That's the way it is being a pastor. It all comes first sometimes before the demands of your own family if you're not careful. Add to it the weight and the burden of what Peter says that you know you're going to give an account to God for the souls of people. Do you know how hard your pastors work? Do you appreciate how hard your pastors work? Secondly, pastors are over you in the Lord. Over you, is, it's this idea of they, they stand before you. It's a word that speaks of leading. And it would be easy to use that description as an excuse for abusing power and control. Many pastors do that. They abuse their leadership. They exercise authority with their power and their control over people. But Jesus clearly and pointedly told his disciples that the way they lead was to be different than the way the world's leaders lead. I don't know if you remember this moment in Mark when he says that you know how the leaders of the, world, of the Gentile world do it. They exercise great authority. They lord it over, he says. Then he looks at his disciples and he says, but not you. Not so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your what? Your servant. And whoever would be first among you would be your slave. Why? For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Sanctified leaders are men who follow Jesus in the way they lead. Sanctified leaders are men who model Jesus in the way they lead. They love the sheep. They serve the sheep. They give up their lives for the sheep. That's the call. That's the conviction. That's the commitment of a sanctified leader. And lastly, they admonish you, he says. They admonish you. And I think that's the most difficult job, part of a pastor's job. I mean, think about it. Few people like to go and confront something in somebody's life, right? And even fewer people like it when somebody comes to them to confront an issue in their life. And yet, if we want to build one another up as Christians, if we want it to be a church that's a, abounding in this sanctification in every area of our life, there are certain thoughts, certain attitudes, certain behaviors in all of us that need to be transformed by God's indwelling Spirit 
to look more like Jesus. I don't know what they are for you. I know what they are in my life. And by the power of God's Spirit, I, I want to be yielding to His Spirit so that He can change those things in my life. How willing are you to change? How welcoming would you be for your pastor to point out what needs to be changed? How would you respond? Pastors, my friends, how well are you leading? Would someone looking in from the outside world and see your leadership see a Christ-like distinction in what you do? Is your constant quest, your constant desire, your constant thing on your mind, how does this church can abound in sanctification and look more like Jesus? Look at the response they deserve. Respect. To be esteemed highly. To be loved, he says. Why? Not simply because they labor hard. Not simply because they lead well. Not simply because they're willing to confront hard issues. Rather because the goal of all they do is a sanctified church. A body of believers who are being continually built up. That's what this connects to. Building up to reflect Jesus more and more to a watching and waiting world. There's actually one more response. Look at it in verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. You know, you know what I think of that when I read that? That is the best gift you can give a pastor. Peaceful sanctification from a peaceful admonition that brings a peaceful response that leads to a peaceful sanctification. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that make the hardest part of a pastor's job become easy? Well, that's his word about the leaders. What about the word about yourselves? goes on, verse 14, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. The responsibility that we all have begins admonish one another. Notice how quickly we bump into that idea again. We just ended with it, and we bump right into admonishing. Why? What's the significance? Well, what we discover is admonition, or this idea of warning other people, is not simply the pastor's job. It's everyone's job. But it's not like we need to start running around admonishing everybody on Sunday morning. Oh, you better not do that. Oh, you better not do that. You need to change this. There's a particular problem, a particular person that Paul has in mind. Do you see it? The idol. The idol person. And don't poke your teenage son in the, <laughs> in the rib and say, hey, lazy, listen up. This one's for you. Don't do that. That's not what he's talking about. Idleness in the church at Thessalonica seems to be connected to faulty views of Christ's return. Faulty views of Christ's return that were swirling around and troubling the believers. You can see that not only in this letter, but in the next letter that he writes to the church. It seems like some people were leaving their jobs to just wait for the Lord to return. It seems to have been a growing problem. It seems to have been a persistent problem. And it got so bad, Paul finally advised the church in 2 Thessalonians to stay away from those people. They're not doing anybody any good. 
But we get the idea of what admonition is. It's helping someone see where their beliefs and their behaviors do not match what God's word says. It's not based on your preference. It's not based on your opinion. It's not based on on what you think is good and right. It's based on what God's word says. And it's warning them of the dangers if they persist. It's warning them of the consequences if they do not change. It's not easy, but it's necessary at times if we want to be conformed to Jesus. Look at the next one, encourage the faint-hearted. I just want to make one comment about that because this is one of the sweetest parts of this. Faint-hearted is the translation of a compound word that creates an image in your mind. There, there are many words like that. And they, I think they're really helpful to, to understand what is being said. The image here is someone who is literally small-souled. Can you get the picture? Somebody with a small soul. It's a soul that is tender. It's a soul that is fragile. It's a soul that's delicate, easily broken, blown away like a feather. That's the small soul. Now I want you to picture a small-souled person caught up in the middle of the mob that came after Paul when he first came to Thessalonica. I don't know if you read that. I just want to read you these verses in Acts 17. It says, The Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar, and they attacked the house of Jason. And they were looking to bring Paul and his friends out. And when they couldn't find them, they dragged Jason and some of his friends before the authorities, shouting, These men have come here. They're acting against the decrees of Caesar. Picture the small-souled person getting caught up in that. The church was still facing that same opposition. And the small-souled believer could very well be the next Jason. And the danger is that the small soul shrinks back. Paul was very fearful of this thing. He wrote about it in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 in this letter. So he says, encourage the small soul. Build up the small soul. Strengthen the small soul so they might stand in the face of that kind of opposition like Jesus did. It's all about becoming more like Jesus. Help the weak, he says. I read a lot of comments about that, but I think the best idea of this exhortation is seen when you read the Gospels. And look at how many times we read over and over how Jesus helped the weak. And how this impacted the people is illustrated in Mark 6. When Jesus crosses over a lake They come to land, they moor to the shore, and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him. And the question is, what did they recognize about Jesus? Not simply who he is, but what he does. He helps the weak. So in the next sentence, we read that they ran about the whole region, began to bring sick people in their beds. They didn't even get them up and put them in a wheelchair. They they bring them in their beds to wherever they heard that Jesus was. Why? Because they knew Jesus helped the weak. If you want a label that could describe Everything that Jesus was doing 
in almost every paragraph of the gospel message, you could probably put it this way. He's helping the weak. If we want a church which glorifies Jesus in all we do, perhaps that label could be a measurement of what we do. Does it help the weak? And then he says, be patient with them all. What a wonderful summary. You're admonishing. You got weak people. Be patient. It sets the tone of our sanctification, doesn't it? It describes the atmosphere of a sanctified church. Oh, we're not perfect. We're patient. It gives us a meter to set the pace for our expectation of our growth into the likeness of Jesus. Leaders, listen to that. You won't see change overnight. Be patient. Then he says, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do it good for one another and to everyone. Why this? Why does he say that there? Well, I think each section ends with something about peace. Remember he ended the first section, be at peace with all? This is the way peace comes about. This is how you keep peace. Not repaying evil for evil always seeking to do good to everyone. He has a word about our worship. Verse 16, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit, he says. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. I think it's necessary to set the stage and see the stage and understand the setting for these commands because it brings a cohesion to what he's saying, a clarity to what he intends. And the setting seems to be the corporate gathering of believers here, probably for their time of weekly worship. Now, why would I say that? Well, first, as we said earlier, all the verbs are plural. This is not simply you and other people. It's, it's us together. He's addressing the church as a whole. Second, if you'll notice in verses 21 and 22, or 20 and 21, there is instruction regarding the prophetic proclamation of God's word and an evaluation from those who hear. So it's not simply reading my Bible. It's hearing the, prophet, the, the prophecy. It's responding to the prophecy. Third, the first three commands, rejoice, pray, and give thanks, seem to be shaped by Israel's praise book, the Psalms. If you've read through the Psalms, you'll, you'll, you'll notice how many times there's rejoicing, how many times there's praying, how many times there's giving thanks. And we know from Paul's other letters that the Psalms were used for, corporate, for worship even in the Gentile churches. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, when you come together, each one has a psalm. Each one has a word. Fourth, I think it helps us make sense out of the last command, abstain from every form of evil. Why would he add that? How does that fit with worship? Well, the early church worship didn't follow the pattern of worship from the Old Covenant. That happened in the temple. The early church moved out of the temple because they are the temple, right? The early church didn't follow those patterns. They were establishing new patterns. Nothing was set yet. And all the gatherings that you see in Acts are descriptive. They're not prescriptive. In Corinth, the structure of the gatherings was quite informal. It says that people brought songs to sing and they brought lessons to teach. So it wasn't like you had one man stand preparing one sermon for the entire congregation 
you had multiple people bringing multiple things to say from God's word. And multiple people bringing songs to sing that encourage their hearts. And the danger was that they could bring the wrong thing and they could lead others in doing the wrong thing. Do you hear that? They could bring the wrong thing and they could lead others in doing the wrong thing. This is what happened at Corinth with the pseudo tongues in their midst. They brought the wrong thing. It also happened at Corinth with the Lord's table. They led others to do the wrong thing in 1 Corinthians 11. There was always the possibility that a new convert who used to worship at the altars of the Roman gods might bring a song, introduce us teaching, or suggest a practice that was pagan, not Christian. So Paul says, abstain. Don't let that be brought into the worship. One last observation of this section. Do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies go hand in hand. They belong together. Listen, the spirit of God works through the word of God to sanctify the people of God. There's a lot of confusion about that in the contemporary church. In one large section of the contemporary church, the focus is on the word of God's spirit with a slight nod to God's word. In another large section of the Christian church, the focus is on God's word with a slight nod to God's spirit. But in the Bible, from the first pages in Genesis, we discover that the spirit of God always works through the Word of God to accomplish God's purposes. And here, God's purpose is for the church to be sanctified. So squench, quenching the Spirit, despising prophecies, are actually two sides of the same coin. They both express a refusal to be thank, sanct, uh, sanctified. So we might ask, what are these prophecies? There's a lot of confusion about that as well. Most people I've talked to over the years have think that prophecy has to do primarily with future events and new revelation. But in the Bible, prophecy has to do primarily with the proclamation and examination that comes from God's word. Only about 25% of the written prophecy in our Bible is new revelation. The rest concerns an examination of what God has already said, an evaluation of how the people of God were doing. For an example of that, the prophets actually became the counselors to the kings in Israel's history. I don't know if you remember that in Israel's history. They were the ones that counseled the king to tell them how well they were keeping the covenant or how far they had gone astray. In the New Testament, the prophets were primarily taking the words and the gospel of Jesus and proclaiming how they fulfilled the whole of God's prior revelation. That's what the prophets were doing. And they were helping the people of God evaluate how well they were following Jesus and walking according to his new covenant. Some prophecies from the apostles spoke of future things, but most prophecies in the early church were from teachers examining the scriptures, expositing the scriptures for the transformation and sanctification of the church. I think that's the sense here of what prophecies are. And that type of prophecy was not infallible any more than preaching is today. So Paul encouraged the church to test what was taught 
See if their words actually proclaimed the salvation that comes in Jesus. See if they actually proclaimed the sanctification which His Spirit brings. If, he, if they do, hold to them. And listen, the temptation of the examiner would be to listen with a critical ear and not like what he hears and quench the work of sanctification that God's Spirit wants to produce in their mind and heart and life. I think quenching the Spirit and listening to the prophetic word go together. It's because it's through the word preached that the Spirit moves to change us into the image of Jesus. So the question is valid today. Do we listen to the teaching of God's word to hear how the Spirit of God wants to work His sanctification in us? Or do we quench the Spirit's sanctification? Do we despise the evaluation that prophecies bring into our lives? I'll leave you to sort that out. A word about your God. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. He says, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Two observations. First, the sanctification we need cannot be accomplished on our own. You can't change like this in your own power. It is dependent upon God's power in us. It's the work of God's Spirit in you. That's what sanctification is. Second, and this is encouraging, I hope, we'll never be the perfect church. God knows we won't be the perfect church. We'll never reach our full sanctification in this life. There will always be some aspect of our flesh or some residue of our sin that will keep us from it. But notice how kind and wonderful and powerful God is. He will complete our sanctification. Isn't that hopeful? That what doesn't get done here will be done before I meet Jesus. He will do that. He will make sure every part of our being is kept blameless when Jesus comes. Amen? Isn't that encouraging? And Paul adds this, and he's faithful. He will do it. What an encouraging thought to people who want to become more like Christ, but the more they go down the path, the more they see their sin, and they want to listen, and they want to respond, but it, it, it's such a difficult process, and they're trying hard, but God wants, they know at the middle of it all, they don't even know the parts God wants to change. Because God wants every part of us sanctified. I don't know about you, but listening to the fact that God will complete it, that alone makes me want to excel still more. What a warm letter. What an encouraging letter. I hope you've felt a great encouragement as you've gone through this letter. Wouldn't you love to open your mailbox and find a letter like that? How would you respond? I know I wouldn't read it just once and throw it in the bin. I think I'd place it on my nightstand and read it again and again before I go to sleep at night. I'd memorize it and share parts of it with people that I know. I'd probably share, I'd listen to Paul's encouragement and his commands, and I would respond well knowing that all that he has said is for my good. It's a warm letter. It's a, it's a hopeful letter. It's an encouraging letter. So why the shift of tone in verse 27? Look at it. 
Why does Paul go from such warmth throughout to that strong warning in the end, I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to the brothers. Does that strike you as odd? It did me. I couldn't find an answer for why he says it that way. I found many speculations, but no good answers. Here's the type of ideas Paul, people were throwing out. This is a quote. The charge to read this letter publicly would be a guarantee that the concerns of the letter would be heard by the entire congregation. Well, that's helpful. Really? Like the mail comes, they get this letter from the one who introduced them to Jesus, and they're just going to leave it in the pile on the table by the back door and get to it later? There's got to be another reason. But all I found was speculation. So I'm going to give you my speculation. Here's my speculation. I think it's like a dad with his kids. In fact, Paul actually talked about that warm relationship that he had in this letter, didn't he? Like a nursing mother, like a loving father. I think it's dad, like a dad with his kids on Christmas Eve. Picture the dad with his kids on Christmas Eve. There's anticipation in the air. There's excitement in their hearts. And everyone's giggling. I think that's Paul, I think Paul believes that's the atmosphere this letter will generate when it arrives. They will be as giddy as he was when Timothy came back with news from them. Do you remember how giddy he was? Chapter 3, verse 8. For now, I live. And what does the father do in the middle of all the excitement and anticipation and giggling? He looks his kids in the eye and he sternly says, go to bed. And they look back and their smiles get bigger, fully knowing he's joking and they giggle even louder. I think that's what Paul intends. I, it's the only thing that I can figure out. It's such a drastic change in tone. So here's the way I picture it. The amanuensis has finished his letter. He walks into Paul's office to get his signature. And it's kind of like this. Okay, boss. That's the amanuensis. This is Paul. Okay, boss. The letter's done. I think it's really nice. I think it's one of your best. It's warm. It's encouraging. These, they're really going to know you love them. That bit about Timothy, it brought tears to my eyes. I'll bet they get the whole church together as quickly as possible so everyone can hear what you have to say. Want to add anything? And Paul gets a smile on his face and a gleam in his eye. And he says, yeah. Hand it to me. And he writes the charge that sounds like the dad with the kids saying, go to bed with every intention of raising the mood of excitement. Enjoy. <laughs> Can I say that again? Paul takes the letter. He writes the charge that sounds like the dad saying, go to bed. With every intention of raising the mood of excitement and joy. And you know what happens? In years to come, the kids will remember that moment. And they say, wasn't that just like dad? Wasn't that just like Paul? The Paul that we know in Thessalonica. The Paul who is the, like a warm mother, a loving father. 
I think it is. That's my speculation. But this isn't. I don't think there's another letter like it in the whole New Testament. And it ends with such an encouraging thought. Keep growing. Keep abounding. As God's sanctified people. As you endure suffering. And wait for the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that my words have been sufficient to stir hearts. But even if they aren't, I know that your Holy Spirit works through your word to bring about the change you desire. So Lord, sanctify us. Help us want to be sanctified in every area, not only individually, but as a church. That every ministry, that every activity, that every life would so resemble Christ that people look and they say, I want to be a part of that family. That there's such joy, that there's such excitement in the sanctification that the Holy Spirit brings. Jesus, we thank you for your salvation. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your sanctification. Let us be faithful all our days to pursue this with joy. I pray this in your son's name. Amen.